Good morning, everyone. This is John Shaw, the director of the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. Thanks for joining another installment of our series, Understanding Our New World. And today we're delighted to be joined by a remarkable guest, uh, Professor Andrew Basevich. Andrew was born in, in Normal, uh, grew up in Indiana, attended West Point, uh, entered in 1965, I believe, had a distinguished 20 year, 23 year career in the Army, uh, served uh, in Vietnam, uh, retired as a colonel, has had a stellar academic year uh, career. He was a, has a doctorate in international history from Princeton, has taught at West Point, uh, Johns Hopkins Sice, and at Boston University where he's an emeritus professor. Um, he is now the president of a group called the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. We want to hear a lot about that. And we also want to discuss his book, a uh, new book out called After the Apocalypse. Uh, Andrew is a prolific writer, and this is a really interesting and provocative book. And I will just say, you know, we're, we're on the eve of the 20th anniversary of 9-11, and probably no one in the country has thought more, I think, probingly about American foreign policy over these last two decades than Andrew and has some really important perspectives to share with us. So with that, uh, Andrew's joining us from his home outside of Boston. So Andrew, good morning. Good morning. Well, uh, we, we talked a little bit offline. You were born in normal Illinois, although I think you, you, you spent more of your growing up period in sort of East Chicago, Hammond area. Talk, us about, talk about your Midwestern uh, upbringing. Well, my parents were both, uh, my dad was from Indiana. My mom grew up in Peru, Illinois. Okay. They both served in World War II. Uh, they, ca they came home and fell in love, got married in 1946. Uh, and my dad uh, went to Illinois Wesleyan uh, on the GI Bill. That's why I was born in Normal in okay. 1947. <laughs> Uh, and then after he finished there, we went to Chicago. He went to Loyola for medical school, became a doctor, a little time in the army. And then we went back to Northwest Indiana where, where he had grown up. So that's mostly where, where I grew up. And then you grad, that you entered West Point, I believe in 1965. And um, obviously an important time in American life. I mean, the Vietnam War is raging. There's actually a remarkable book has been written about the class of 66, I think the yep. long gray line, which is sort of rough contemporary. There was probably, a, these people were probably a few years older than you. Tell us about West Point at that time. Well, actually it was a very strange time, I think, to go to the military academy. Uh, and so I, so I was a cadet from 1965 to 1969 what was happening at home during that period of time. Well, the 60s were happening. It was sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Well, that wasn't happening at West Point. Uh, so, so there we were, you know, uh, 40 or so miles up the Hudson River from New York City, uh, re reading the New York Times every day, and therefore bearing witness to uh, the transformation in our politics and in our culture that was ongoing, but in a sense, not participating. You know, had I gone to Illinois Wesleyan like my dad did, I'm sure I would have probably ended up a different person than I did. What's going on in the world from 65 to 69? Well, the war in Vietnam is going on. I mean, it, the, the war in Vietnam occurring in the context of the pre-existing Cold War, but a, a specific war that doesn't go well, divides the country, has deeply corrosive effects on the, on the army as an institution. So that when we graduated in 1969, most of us knew we were gonna go to the, serve in, in, in Vietnam, but we also understood that uh, you know, the, war, <laughs> the war was not headed toward a happy ending to put it, to put it mildly. Uh, and, uh, and, and I, I mean, I, I personally came away from the war believing that the, the, the biggest thing to me was that I had uh, seen at first hand uh, what happens when an army disintegrates. And I had seen at first hand what happens when uh, a citizen army is committed to what turns out to be a protracted and controversial uh, war. Uh, really, that was, the, that, that was what stuck with me most of all for my own Vietnam service. 
Some years ago, I had an interview with Senator Hagel and about his, you know, his, his work on foreign policy. And he, you know, fought, fought in Vietnam. And I said, you know, how did Vietnam shape you? And he kind of smiled. He said, you know, I'd love to tell you that I was, that it, that it provoked deep geostrategic thinking. He said, but I was just trying to survive, trying to get out there in one piece with my friends, my brother. He said, when you're in a war, particularly one that isn't going well, you, you want to be a good soldier and you want to survive and you want your friends to survive. And you're aware of the, the context, but it, it's not front and center. Is that your experience? Yeah, I, I mean, I think my personal experience was uh, quite a bit different from uh, Senator Hegel's, but I, I agree with his framing. You know, I stayed in the army after Vietnam, and the army decided to send me to graduate school to study history at Princeton University. So I was uh, at Princeton thrust into, uh, to put it mildly, a radically different environment uh, that that challenged me to begin, and I emphasize begin, thinking critically about, about our past. Uh, so to his point, it, it probably was beginning at Princeton, but continuing beyond graduate school, that I began to puzzle over, uh, puzzle over the Vietnam, but, but more broadly puzzle over the trajectory of, 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 of US history and of the evolving uh, claims uh, that the United States made in, as a you know, so-called leader of, of, of the world. Um, I, the journey continued and it probably led me in a, in a more critical direction that in reaching conclusions that I probably didn't want to share with my mother whose own view of US history was turned out to be radically different based on her upbringing and based on her uh, service in World War II. Well, you've written a lot about just the power of the kind of World War II story and kind of in the, in the popular frame, it's a reluctant nation, you know, is attacked, enters the war, uh, summons the forces of good, defeats the forces of evil, um, the good guys triumph. And you say, I mean, that you, you believe that that framing has, has, has sort of almost consumed the foreign policy discussion, and of course, leads, leads out complexities like Stalin's role, who probably was almost as awful as Hitler, but played a, right. probably a larger role in defeating Hitler than, than we did. So talk about the importance of the World War II narrative in American life. Well, I do think it overshadows uh, it, it, more, more than the revolution, uh, more than the Civil War. Uh, I think today the, the framing that we choose in, in thinking about World War II uh, has, has a perhaps imperceptible imper but profound impact on the way we position ourselves as a nation. You know, one of, one of my early memories as a kid, we were living in Chicago and my dad was going to medical school. We're living in public housing because we didn't have any money was getting up early in the morning uh, and looking at our little black and white TV set, must have had like a 12 inch screen and watching Victory at Sea. Now, for, for those who don't know Victory at Sea, it was a documentary series, uh, uh, mostly using uh, footage made by the Navy and the Marine Corps that showed over, I don't know how many episodes, 15, 20, uh, the way that the Navy conducted itself in World War II. It's brilliant. Uh, it's, it's moving. It's got a great uh, uh, a soundtrack uh, by, by, by Richard Rogers. And one cannot watch Victory at Sea without being inspired and moved and deeply appreciative of what the Americans who served in World War II achieved for our country and for the world. But guess what? It is, to put it mildly, an incomplete rendering of the story. So I think that, uh, I can't prove this, I can't give you any survey data, that the vast majority of our fellow citizens, even if they've never watched Victory at Sea, basically adhered to a Victory at Sea interpretation of World War II. And it's inadequate and it's misleading. And I think especially to the point 
uh, it's no longer really germane uh, given where the world is and, and we, where we are uh, as, as part of that world. So I guess I've outgrown victory at sea <laughs> uh, and come to a different understanding of World War II and therefore a different understanding of, of, our, of, of, you know, of who we are. Well, let's talk about your new book, After the Apocalypse, which was written, I believe, from March through like roughly October of 2020. So just as COVID is, you know, forcing us all, you know, behind closed doors and so forth. And as I understand uh, some of your notes, I mean, it's, it's to some extent inspired by a, a book written in the 19, 1940s by Mark Bloch, a, a Frenchman who who was just despairing about the, the defeat of, of France. And it was just sort of a a critique of the leadership and just kind of a cry of, of, of desperation. Talk about the impetus for this book and particularly how it might connect to the Black work. So uh, Marc Bloch uh, was a, a French historian of considerable renown who had served as a frontline soldier in World War I and who was recalled to active duty at the beginning of World War II. But by this point, he is He's no longer a young man, and he's, a, he's basically an overage captain. He's, he's not assigned to a frontline unit. He's a staff officer serving at some higher headquarters. And it's, it's from that vantage point that he witnesses uh, what we have come to call the Battle of France. That is to say the, the period in the spring and early summer of 1940 when the Wehrmacht uh, invades France and in amazingly, uh, short order, uh, Mark Bloch's army capitulates. Um, he chooses to write a short book of analysis trying to explain why this happened. He calls the book, uh, the English translation, Strange Defeat. <clears throat> and it's an indictment. It's an indictment of, of France's uh, senior political and military leadership. From his point of view, <clears throat> the answer to why France was defeated is because the politicians and the generals utterly, completely failed to meet their responsibilities. And so as I was uh, witnessing the, <coughs> excuse me, witnessing the events of 2020, the pandemic, the economic consequences of the pandemic, further evidence of catastrophic climate change manifesting itself at that time last summer in, uh, in wildfires out on the Pacific coast. This summer, wildfires plus hurricanes. Uh, all this occurring in the context of the Trump presidency. Uh, my view of President Trump was that he was ill-equipped for the office, not particularly interested in actually governing, <clears throat> utterly incompetent. Also all of this happening in the context of a, of a reckoning with race, um, which in turn, of course, uh, prompted a uh, white nationalist backlash. It just seemed to me, uh, not in an explicit way, but in a more general way, that we were experiencing something comparable to what to the disaster that had befallen the French in the summer of 1940. <laughs> because of the pandemic, I had time in my hands, I guess. Uh, so I decided to try to write something comparable to Black's defeat. No, no pretense of distance, but an immediate response immediately have to try to explain how this series of disasters uh, befell us. And that the result was this very short uh, book that you uh, kindly held up a couple of minutes ago uh, called After the Apocalypse. Well, let me read a couple sentences and then just have you expand on them. And it's, uh, you write, the calamities that accumulated during 2020 fostered a sense of things coming undone. The political order seemed unable to cope. Crises followed one another in rapid succession, 
testing Americans that they had not been tested for generations. Each crisis compounded the significance of the others. Taken together, they gave birth to a moment of profound and disturbing revelation. The revelation being that this country had just tragically fallen off course. What was the revelation to you? I think, I think the biggest revelation, you're, you're asking actually the core question, which nobody's asked me before. The biggest revelation is that we had misapprehended the world. We Americans, we had misapprehended the world. And compounding that problem is that we had misapprehended our, our place in the world. Uh, in some respects, <laughs> this is a book that I've written like six times now, uh, going back to the end of the Cold War, uh, which, which elicits from the political establishment, from the media, to some degree from our intelligentsia, uh, an effort to explain what the American victory, as it was perceived, I think misperceived, the American victory was all about. And the answers were quite emphatic. History had ended. We were the sole superpower. No alternative existed to American global leadership. The universal embrace of American style, liberal democratic capitalism was now certain. And, and these attitudes permeated our politics at the national level at least, shaped the conversation. And I think sent us on a trajectory then, uh, beginning in the 1990s. The most uh, vivid, distinctive expression of that trajectory related to the use of American military power. So we, a minute ago, we talked about, you know, when I grew up, I grew up during the Cold War. When I went to West Point, it was still the Cold War. I served in Vietnam. Despite the disaster of Vietnam, if we look, if we look at US national security policy over the length of the Cold War, from the 1940s to the end of the 1980s, the primary, not sole, but the primary purpose of, of American, of the United States military, the primary explanation for why we chose to develop a huge, costly military establishment from the 40s to the 80s was to prevent World War III from happening. The idea, the idea was to deter Soviet aggression. The idea was to contain Soviet power, to defend Western Europe, to defend Korea, to defend Japan. That was the idea. Something very important happened after the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. And that is that there was a fundamental rethinking in Washington about the purpose of American military power. And the new idea was, given the immensity of our military advantages, we can put American military power to work. This is an instrument that can be used to solve problems, not to be, not to be held in reserve. And so what happens is uh, the beginning of, a, of, of a, a sequence of military activism that signals a radical change in our, our, our posture. I mean, it's it, totally forgotten now. You know, the fall of the Berlin Wall is October of 89. Totally forgotten. December of 1989, George Herbert Walker Bush intervenes in Panama to overthrow the regime there. Now, wh wh whether you think that was a good idea or a bad idea, that was episode number one in what becomes a, a, almost an endless sequence of inter in interventionism. You know, whether we're talking about uh, Iraq multiple times, Somalia, Haiti, Bosnia, Kosovo, 
uh, and on and on and on. Uh, now, early on, most of those interventions are relatively small scale. I think virtually all of them are relatively brief, but 9-11 changes all that. The wars become much longer, they become larger, they become more costly. Uh, and, and to me, that's the, the, that's the story I keep telling over and over again that I can't, <laughs> I guess I don't do a good job of telling it. Uh, but that pivot, that change in our, in our sense of, of what military power exists to do, I think sent us down a path of, uh, of disaster that uh, has all kinds of implications that are, are, are social, are political, are economic, and so on. Well, Andrew, you write uh, in terms of, you know, after 9-11 and the so-called uh, global war on terrorism that President Bush 43 launched, and you call it an artifice designed to disguise a neo-imperial enterprise, its unacknowledged purpose to pacify and transform a large swath of the Islamic world relying on American military power to achieve that end. Talk about the, the in your view, the folly of the construct of the a global war on terror. Well, I mean, I think, I think the place to begin is to remember that 9-11 uh, occurs. There is a, an immediate and I think justifiable uh, response that focuses on Afghanistan, which is where bin Laden had, had found sanctuary. But as soon as the Taliban are overthrown, this is roughly what, uh, maybe around the first week of December, I think, of, uh, of 2001. But before Afghanistan, before we really have settled on uh, a, a policy toward Afghanistan, uh, the, the George W. Bush administration and the, and the military make a 180 degree turn to focus on Iraq. Uh, Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11, nothing. Now, th there, there was an effort on the part of some within the administration to concoct uh, an argument that they were implicit or to concoct uh, a claim that uh, Saddam was developing weapons of mass destruction and if he acquired them that that would be, you know, he would hand them over to the terrorists. But all that was concocted. But Iraq became the target. Why? What was going on? Uh, I am absolutely persuaded. And it's not, you know, it's not, it's not that President Bush gave us a speech and said, here's my five point plan. Here's what I'm going to do. But I'm absolutely persuaded that uh, senior members of that administration, the, the president, but probably even more powerfully, uh, Vice President Cheney, Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld, Deputy Defense Secretary Paul Wolfowitz uh, certainly recognized that 9-11 was a tragedy and a disaster, but also saw it as an opportunity to be seized. And the opportunity to be seized was now to, to fix the Middle East, to, to put American military power to work on the grandest scale, not simply, you know, to feed the starving in Somalia, but to bring about a regional transformation. And the way to do that was to focus initially on transforming Iraq. Nobody, nobody liked Saddam Hussein. He was virtually friendless in the entire you know, international order. So nobody was gonna shed any tears uh, if the United States overthrew Saddam Hussein. But the, but the, the administration's expectation is that when we demonstrate our ability to do that, our ability and our willingness to engage in preventive war, to eliminate this evil regime, and further, when we then subsequently demonstrate our ability to make something better in Iraq, to create a liberal order. Well, when we do that, our influence, our leverage, our position will be dramatically enhanced 
And then when we go have a conversation with the leaders of the mullahs, in, or the, the leaders in, the, uh, in Tehran, or the dictator who runs Egypt, or the corrupt monarch or royal family in Saudi Arabia, and we say, hey, listen to me. Take, remember what happened to Saddam. We need you to change your behavior or you may suffer the same fate. So their expectation was by making Iraq a great victory that we would be then in a position to powerfully influence the course of events in, in the entire region. And guess what? We overthrew Saddam and we got a quagmire, a mess. We demonstrated the limits of our ability, the limits of our military capacity, and we demonstrated our inability to bring about a political transformation taking a, 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 a country that had been you know, mired in authoritarianism and somehow transform it into a democracy. So, so the grand plan of the, of, the, of the Bush administration never got past Iraq. And indeed, the grand plan ended up with us having protracted war in Iraq, protracted war in Afghanistan, that Bush passes on to his successor, Obama, and Obama passes on to his successor, uh, 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 Trump. Andrew, you wrote um, about uh, Iraq. You say B Bush's Operation Iraqi Freedom equaled the folly of Bonaparte's and Hitler's attempts to conquer Russia, if on a blessedly smaller scale. A common error linked the three episodes. The quickest way to doom an empire is to expand when consolidation is the order of the day. Well, the end of the Cold War did, in fact, leave us in a remarkably favorable position. Uh, and, and I do think that if we look at US policy since the end of the Cold War, we've squandered those advantages. I mean, uh, estimated costs of the post 9-11 wars uh, now exceed $8 trillion. Uh, there was a study released uh, two weeks ago, I think, that says that the cost of caring for Iraq and Afghanistan veterans between now and 2050 is going to be over $2 trillion. And guess what? In 2050, they're going to be living another couple of decades. So the cost will probably be at least double that amount. So we're a rich country, uh, but by golly, we have wasted a lot of money. Uh, in these uh, futile military uh, efforts. And I think we've, squ we've squandered our credibility. You know, there certainly has been a great deal of, of criticism of the United States, uh, both with regard to its conduct of the Iraq war and with regard to its conduct of the Afghanistan war. I'm not, I'm not one of the people that believes that, you know, our, our credibility has been destroyed. Nobody will ever trust us again. Uh, you know, they said that they said that at the end of the Vietnam War, uh, and you know, you you can restore credibility, but nonetheless, it certainly has. These wars have been very damaging uh, to our reputation. And the point you make, uh, I, I've seen you speak uh, re quite a bit in recent weeks on the Afghanistan withdrawal, and you said that the U.S. failed in its two fundamental missions or its its efforts to both stand up a credible government and also a credible strong army. Both of those kind of ventures, which were the core of the US mission as it became uh, imploded in failure. Yeah, you know, one of my concerns about uh, sort of the, the conversation about Afghanistan over the past, uh, you know, three weeks or so <clears throat> is that uh, the conversation's kind of been hijacked by the, uh, by the evacuation. They're, they're the media looking for these visuals that will compare the, the last helicopter leaving from Saigon to the last helicopter leaving from, uh, from, from Kabul. And I kind of get that. 
uh, and certainly the, the evacuation was mishandled and was kind of embarrassing. But the big story is what happened in 20 years prior to the evacuation. And what happened in the 20 years prior was a, a major US policy failure. I mean, we, we set out to do two things. We set out to create a, a legitimate government in Kabul that would command the loyalty and support of the Afghan people. And we set out to create uh, security forces, an army and a national police that would be able to provide for the security of the country. Uh, and the, the evidence shows that we failed drastically uh, on both counts. In that sense, I think President Biden's explanation for why it was necessary to, to exit uh, is in, entirely legitimate. Uh, you know, staying another five years didn't seem to me it was going to produce a better outcome. Well, Andrew, one of the points you make is that, you know, part of this formulation is that these wars have been hugely expensive. Um, we've entered wars that we don't know how to win, which is a critical thing. But also it's distracted us some, from, from some hugely important domestic threats, in fact. And, you know, whether it be COVID, whether it be climate. And in your book, I mean, it, it was stunning. You talked about just the damage from hurricanes. And I want to read a couple of numbers and then a short quote, and then you have you expand. You talked in 2005, the damage from Katrina was 125 billion. In 2012, the damage from Sandy was 75. In 2017, Harvey was 125 billion, Irma 65 billion, Maria 91 billion. And you write, had such devastating losses resulted from enemy attack, Americans would have no difficulty in situating them under the heading of national security failures, much like Pearl Harbor or 9-11. As it is, they're written off as misfortunes that fall beyond the writ of our trillion dollar per annum national security apparatus. For any threat to which there is no obvious military response, the national security, the national security state gives itself a pass. Talk about that. So the, this gets to what the phrase national security signifies to us, uh, what it signifies in Washington within the policy community. National, national security relates to threats out there in faraway places, to, 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 to dangers that we identify in Europe or in East Asia or or in, the, in and around the, the Persian Gulf. And national security then presumes that the best way to respond to those dangers out there is by amassing military power, positioning it perhaps in bases abroad, holding it so that as a, in, in, in readiness to intervene. But national security relates to things out there. And one of the points I try to make in the book is that the, the, the threats to our well-being as a people are here, not out there. They are here at home. And the purpose of national security, the primary, not the only, the primary purpose of national security ought to be to provide for our safety and well-being where we live. That requires a radical shift. In, in thinking about what national security means. And if you accept that shift, then that, that leads directly to a radical redistribution of, uh, of, of resources. I mean, I think I give a couple uh, examples in the book. My dad was in the Coast Guard in World War II, so I'm very fond of the Coast Guard. But, but an example, we have the biggest Navy in the world. We've had the biggest and most powerful and, and you know, best Navy in the world since World War II. No question about it. I got nothing against the Navy. Uh, but, but in the present moment, it seems to me, we could do with a somewhat smaller Navy and a somewhat larger Coast Guard. Because the Coast Guard, which, which has a multitude of missions that relate to drugs, crime, the environment, safety, and, and on and on, is, I think, under-resourced. So, so let's have a, a smaller Navy, let's have a bigger Coast Guard. We've got the biggest and the best Air Force in the world and have had since World War II. I got nothing against the Air Force. But 
the US Forest Service, in my opinion, has an inadequate number of aircraft to be used in fighting forest fires. So let's have a smaller Air Force and let's give more airplanes to the Forest Service. I mean, those are just two small examples of, I think, how we should be redistributing resources to increase our capacity to, to deal with those things that endanger us where we live. That's not a prescription for isolationism. Doesn't mean we, we ignore the rest of the world, but it means there's a, there's a rebalancing uh, that I think is called for simply by the facts that we experience. Uh, you know, I mean, you and I are speaking uh, in the in the wake of this latest hurricane Ida, uh, and I, I was a TV program, and then you see these people in Louisiana who, you know, three times in the last twenty years, have essentially had their houses destroyed, their village, their, their towns destroyed. Uh, I don't think it's enough for the federal government to then offer some relief. Uh, wh why can't we provide better warning? Why can't we pri provide more rapid response? Why can't we erect better protections? Yeah, it would cost a lot, uh, but it costs a lot to maintain 11 aircraft carriers uh, or whatever it is that we have right now. So I just, I do think there needs to be a, a national conversation about what is the meaning of national security and what are the actual national security priorities that we should be funding. And in your books, you write about the military industrial complex, <clears throat> excuse me, a term that was, uh, I guess, first used by President Eisenhower in his farewell address. And I, I, you, you mentioned it, and I was actually, I saw an item in the Washington Post this weekend that had me thinking about how you might react to it. And it was called uh, Corporate Boards and Consulting Fees, How U.S. Generals Thrived After Afghanistan. And the focus of the article was General McChrystal, um, and um, who you know, has developed a kind of a, a company that is you know, consulting to state governments and corporate boards, et cetera. And, and I guess the, the reporter was questioning his credibility to do that. And so he talked a little bit about Afghanistan. He said, he called Af Afghanistan you know, a very disappointing outcome, but then added, but I don't think that that means that necessarily many of the decisions made and the strategies pursued were wrong. I think in many cases, they were the best strategy that could have been. Um, how, how do you react to that? I mean, is that someone just trying to, uh, to kind of spin their way out of, uh, not that the war was his fault, but to just try to put uh, a kind of a, a plausible case on it? Well, I mean, I, I don't have an ability to sort of, you know, judge what goes on in his mind, but I mean, I, I think it's fair to say that, uh, uh, you know, that, within the senior ranks of the military, uh, there is not a lot of dissatisfaction about the reigning national security paradigm. The generals and the admirals are very comfortable with thinking of the purpose of the United States military is to, is to be used as instruments of power projection. They're okay with that. And, and therefore, as a broad general statement, I'm sure there are exceptions, in the senior ranks of the military, there's not a lot of openness to thinking critically about, uh, about the results uh, of our policies. So we have somebody like McChrystal asked about Afghanistan, you know, doesn't seem to see any problem. Uh, I mean, I would say, wait a second, a 20 year long war that ends with the enemy in Kabul now controlling the entire country. That's called defeat, that's called failure. Now we, we, sh we shouldn't you know, make an immediate judgment that, the, that the, the, the principal explanation is because people like General McChrystal did a bad job, but there ought to be an honest inquiry into the conduct of the war that begins with the recognition that it was a failure. 
and a failure that, that, that the nation ought to view as unacceptable. If we spend $8 trillion plus thousands of Americans dead, plus tens of thousands of Americans wounded, and the outcome is failure, there ought to be some honest questions asked. And you know, one might say, well, the, the, the generals, uh, you know, they ought to be able to provide some of those answers. But I don't think they're probably inclined to because they're too committed to the status quo. Well, uh, just in this, this article, too, they, they talked to a gentleman from Deutsche Bank who, who employs, uh, I don't know if I'm crystal, but, you know, uh, military people as consultants. And he said, he, he was quoted anonymously, he said, senior management is much more likely to listen to military commanders because they're cool and they've killed people than to a McKinsey guy in a pinstripe suit. Do you think that kind of gets to the culture of the military in American life? It might. I mean, that's really kind of a silly thing to, uh, for him to have, or that person uh, to have said. My guess is that the reason the retired generals end up getting you know, positions on corporate boards uh, and, and the like is that there's an assumption that they can open doors uh, or, or at, a, at a minimum offer useful advice for corporate planners, you know, that there's a particular technology that would be of interest to the Navy uh, that could be used for the following purposes. And, and the generals know what those technologies are and the generals can formulate, or the admirals, and can formulate an argument about why a particular service would, would, uh, would be of interest. I, 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 maybe I'm wrong. But I, I, I doubt that it's, you know, that they killed people. <laughs> Maybe they did kill people. But I doubt if, if that they killed people that, that creates market value here. Right. Well, let's, let's talk about the Quincy Institute and the important work you're doing. And I know that one of in your mission statement, you say your goal is to help uh, create a kind of fundamental rethinking of American foreign policy, you know, leading to a new uh, conceptualization that shifts from endless wars to more vigorous diplomacy. Tell us a little bit about the genesis of the Institute and how you think you, you'll be able to shape the, the public debate. So uh, Ben Rhodes, uh, who was the deputy national security advisor for President Obama and probably his most influential advisor in, in, in helping Obama think through foreign policy issues coined a term to describe the foreign policy establishment. And the term was the blob. And the, and, and the reason the term fits, according to Ben Rhodes, and I probably agree, is that there's a uniformity of thinking. There's, a, there's an absence of, of sort of, of critical thinking within the foreign policy establishment. You know, you might be coded Republican, you might be coded Democrat, you might, you might call yourself a, a liberal, you might call yourself a conservative, but basically everybody in the, in the foreign policy establishment is considered to the same set of propositions. Certainly they're all committed to American global leadership. Certainly they're all committed to, you know, we have to have a, a, huge, uh, a huge level of military spending, lots of bases abroad and so on. So the Quincy Institute exists to try to challenge the blob. Uh, we, we, we want to, um, to offer uh, a different conception of, of foreign policy. And our conception is, is keyed to the principle of restraint. That's the key word for us, restraint. Restraint does not mean isolationism. It does not mean disarmament, does not mean pacifism, but it means being more prudent and careful about the use of American military power. And by extension, it means being more creative about the way we engage the world. Creative in the realm of diplomacy, in the realm of, of, of commerce, in the realm of, of cultural exchange. So, so we're trying to change the conversation. Uh, we are against the blob, but we acknowledge 
But the blob, you know, is is very well established. It's it's very well funded, uh, and 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 therefore uh, bringing about fundamental change is a challenge. It's difficult. We've been doing this for only a couple of years. I think we're engaged in a ten-year project, a twenty-year project. Uh, but we think we can do some good. I think we, we, we believe we're doing some good. Now, we are not of the left or the right. We call ourselves transpartisan, which means we, we welcome support from people who are on the left or on the right. And, and, and you know, they may disagree about a, a thousand different things, but anybody who believes in the principle of restraint as a foundation of US foreign policy, we want them our, uh, on our team. You know, early on, we, we, we don't accept foreign money. We don't accept corporate money, no corporate money. Therefore, we depend on support from foundations and from, from generous uh, individuals who believe in our mission. And early on, we, we got a little bit of publicity because we, we have gotten uh, you know, pretty generous support from, the, from, from Mr. Koch, Charles Koch, and from George Soros. Koch's a conservative, Soros is a progressive. Their foundations both support Quincy because both of those foundations agree that US foreign policy has been a disaster and they agree that restraint may provide a more productive uh, approach. So we're happy to receive uh, support from people who agree with us regardless of where they are uh, on other, other sort of political concerns. You know, we're small. As you mentioned, I'm speaking to you from outside of Boston, but uh, my, my colleagues are, are based in, in Washington. I think we've got like 18 people on the payroll. Uh, we'd like to expand. Uh, we'd like to expand because we'd like to broaden our issues. I mean, we're, we're really, at, at the present moment, we focus on three things. We, we focus on U.S. policy uh, in, in the Middle East, broadly defined to include places like Afghanistan, where we think that the militarization of US policy has been a catastrophe. We're focused on East Asia, because although we recognize that US relations with China are, are, are going to be in some sense adversarial, we think it would be a catastrophe uh, if that results in a new Cold War pitting the United States against the People's Republic of China. Uh, we, we think that We've got these common issues like, uh, the, like the climate crisis that demand something other than a Cold War uh, for our good and for the good of, of the rest of the planet. And we're just trying to change the, 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 uh, the, the third issue we could call grand strategy, where we're just trying to change the conversation about uh, what, what is the basic framework of our, of our role in the world? You know, do we need to have? 750 bases abroad. You know, do, do we need to spend on our military uh, order of magnitude more than you know, the next six, seven, eight, ten 10 countries in the world uh, put together? So those are our priorities. You know, people could say, well, how about, you know, how about, how about Sub-Saharan Africa? You know, how about Latin America? And, and, and our answer would be, we'd like to extend our interest into those regions, but we have to acquire additional resources so that we can have additional staff, so that we can do more than we're doing right now. We're, we're small, we're a startup. Andrew, let's go to a couple of questions that have been emailed in. And the first one comes from Larry in Quincy, Illinois. And he asks, how can the American public become better educated on foreign policy and national security? I might just say, uh, I might plug your books because you write in a wonderfully direct and bracing and interesting style. They're, I mean, they're very uh, 200 pages or so. So, very, so I'll, 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 I'll start out the answer by saying, read your books, but additionally, what plug. else would you suggest to people? So I, I, so I have a contact with Quincy, Illinois, sort of once removed. <laughs> My dad's older brother was named Bron, Bron Basevich. And Bron's early claim to flame, fame was that he was a coach uh, at St. Bede uh, Academy in Peru, Illinois, which my father attended and I attended. And Bron was a great high school coach. 
And when he finished it at, 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 at St. Bede, he went to Quincy and he was the coach at Quincy College for a short period of time. It all fell apart. I'm not sure why, but he, I wouldn't say he left in disgrace, but he left an un, un, unhappy camper. Uh, so, so that's my connection to, uh, to Quincy. But uh, I, I think I, I'm grateful that you mentioned my books. I would say it's not just my books, uh, that there is a considerable amount of critical thinking uh, about uh, US foreign policy. Uh, and, 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 the, and the person who sent the question needs to, needs to be open to it. Uh, you know, if, you, if one reads Foreign Policy Magazine, excuse me, uh, Foreign Affairs Magazine, which I think is the, the most prestigious uh, periodical that deals with US foreign policy, 90% of what you're gonna get is the, is the views of the blob. Of, of the blob. Uh, that doesn't mean it's bad, but it means you're not getting the critical perspective that you might want. From time to time, uh, I write for the American Conservative magazine. Uh, you know, comes out I think six times a year. I, you know, I'm not I'm not in the business of promoting the American Conservative magazine, but the American Conservatives' perspective on foreign policy is very critical, doesn't sort of buy the blobs line. So that's simply an example. Again, I'm not trying to, an example of the fact that there are other, uh, there are other outlets out there that uh, can provide an alternative uh, to, to what the blob has on offer. Jan from Philadelphia wants to know about the the US uh, national security budget broadly, and just particularly the heavy focus on defense at the expense of diplomacy. Do you have just even a rough paradigm of how that a, a more reasonable shift would occur away from the Pentagon and towards State Department and development and other programs? Well, I mean, I, I tried to uh, refer to that briefly a few minutes ago. I, I think you know, I, I don't think I don't think it's possible to say. Well, I'd like to cut the Pentagon budget in half, you know, and increase the State Department's budget by, you know, thirty-three and a third percent. Uh, budgets come out of requirements, and so what we begin is to critically assess the requirements. Uh, I think that th there's an argument made by some that State Department representation in the world is inadequate, uh, that, that we need to have a denser representation in terms of, 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 of consuls. Now, I'd like to see the facts behind all that, but I, I'm, I, I'd be willing to support that. In other words, it's, we, we need to, if, if we have X number of consulates around the world and we evaluate that presence and we conclude that, well, we need to have X plus 30, then you say, well, what's the price tag? How much more money do we need to give the State Department to improve that, to in increase its, its, its capacity? That's how I think we get to budget numbers. Ditto with the, the, the military. I personally think that the US military presence in the Persian Gulf has been totally counterproductive and that we would be better off, quite frankly, pulling the US military out of the Middle East. Well, if you did that, how much money would you save? And that amount of money then can be taken from the, from the Pentagon's uh, budget. So it's in terms of, of, of capabilities, commitments, that leads to conclusions about resources that then finally leads to a number of, of, a, of a budget going up or going down. And I saw you on an interview with uh, Brian Lamb some years ago in which uh, you discussed what it means to be a conservative. And, and you, it was very provocative. I mean, you were saying a conservative you know, is based on the word conserve. So a really passionate conservative should be a really passionate environmentalist and should be very skeptical of overseas interventions with the notion of remaking societies, should be very suspicious of a large you know, defense establishment with concentrated power and money. 
Tell me, maybe to expand, what is a conservative and how can that more traditional sense of conservative, maybe in the Dwight Eisenhower sense, come back to a more um, prominent place in American life? Well, my conception of conservatism has uh, different uh, aspects, and some of the, some of them are are fairly uh, traditional. Uh, you know, I, I believe I I think I think the excessive concentration of power is a concern. You know? So, in terms of the governance of the United States, I like to see authority exercised locally as much as possible. But I think to get to get to the real essence of your question, I think conservative the the, the real the, the real core of conservatism should focus on stewardship, of preserving our inheritance. Now, as a conservative, I think a considerable part of that inheritance is in the realm of culture, of 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 maintaining the a cultural legacy but also of maintaining traditional practices created by our forebears way back when that should not, in my mind, sort of be discarded as I think is the tendency today. I, this is a, you know, this is a political remark now, I'm uncomfortable with the notion that we all can sort of just invent families. Uh, I, think, I think that there, there are traditional family structures uh, that generally serve us well. But to your other point, certainly stewardship ought to include the natural world. Uh, it boggles the mind to me that people who profess to be conservatives basically wanna raise every tree in sight so they can put up another strip mall. How can that be conservative? Uh, so, Probably wouldn't have been true of me 30 years ago or 40 years ago, but yeah, I am an environmentalist. Uh, I mean, I think we, 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 we cannot afford uh, to take this planet of ours uh, uh, you know, for granted. Uh, and and I, I don't know why every other person who claims to be a conservative doesn't have the same position. Well, and I'd like to end this, uh conversation with, uh, we have a lot of students watching and just sort of what sort of career advice or kind of life advice. But I saw a podcast you did recently, and it was a fun podcast in which you, you, you recited 10 lessons you've learned over the last 50 years. And I want to read two or three of them and have you expand on them. One of them, uh, you were just saying, um, empathy is important and ambition can cause blindness. Develop that thought on just um, how that connects to your your career. Well, I mean, I think a, an, ab, an absence of empathy has been one of my great uh, weaknesses. Uh, it took me too long to appreciate uh, that. And I think one of the reasons I, it took so long is because I was, when I was young, uh, I was ambitious. You know, back when I was in the army, uh, and doing what you had to do to make the next uh, rung up the ladder or the greasy pole. Uh, probably uh, I paid more attention to that than I, I should have. And in, in retrospect, I regret it deeply. Uh, I think the most important thing is to, is, is, is self-knowledge to understand who you are. And quite frankly, I think in, in when, I, when I was a younger person, uh, I was pursuing goals that actually I didn't actually want to achieve because I didn't come to a sufficient understanding of who I am as an individual. What, what gives me satisfaction? What kind of work? What kind of circumstance? Uh, and, and you know, I think you take it, one, one takes it for granted that you know yourself, but I think, uh, I think it tends not to be the case. Self-knowledge uh, requires a lot of self-reflection to achieve. Once you know yourself, then I think it becomes a lot easier to you know, chart a course in life. Well, let me, let me throw out a couple others that you mentioned, one of which I'm like, my staff will laugh because it's music to my ears, which is 
social media is evil. <laughs> well, I don't do I don't do you know Facebook. <laughs> I don't do uh, you know Twitter, LinkedIn. I, I do. I, I don't have a I don't have a smartphone. Obviously, I'm I'm talking to you on Zoom, so it's not as if I'm totally opposed to technology. But I do think that well, I think there's lots of evidence uh, that this this stuff takes over our life, uh, and 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 warps it. Uh, I, I myself, I know I spend too much time online, and I can tell that it becomes harder for me to pick up a book and to devote sustained attention to the book because I want something that's quick. You know, I, I suffer from FOMO, you know, fear of missing out if I don't check my email with frequency. So I'm trying to keep I'm trying to keep that at bay, but by no means am I sort of innocent of this uh, of this phenomenon. Well, the last one you said: take long walks with your spouse. That's the key to a successful marriage. There's absolutely <laughs> no doubt of it in my mind. There's nothing to do except talk to each other, right? And even when you're in a busy, if you take a, there's nothing to do except to talk to one another. And you're not talking to one another about you know, the future of the, of the world, we talk to one another about your shared life. And I think that is uh, invaluable. Well, Andrew, this has been a wonderful conversation. Um, we'd love to coax you back to Illinois when travel allows. Uh, maybe we could work out a trip through uh, Illinois Wesleyan and Normal and then bring you down to Carbondale and uh, you know, meet with students. I'm sure you'll have a new book out before too long. And we would just love to, uh, to learn more about you and, and your, your vision of this country. Cause I think your, your ability to challenge just kind of conventional thinking um, is really invaluable because people do get into kind of this locked in mindset and you really, your writing is extraordinarily bracing and provocative and, and rewarding. Well, I thank you very, very much for that. And I thank you very, very much for this conversation. Great. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for watching another edition of our series, Understanding Our New World. We'll have a video of this conversation with Andrew on our website tomorrow. Please look at it and send it to family and friends. And thank you for supporting the Institute and keeping the legacy of Paul Simon alive and well. Thanks so much.